This is our first PowerPoint when looking at the end of the 20th century. And what we're going to be looking at here is the first president, or at least America, under the first president of the United States during the first of these last decades of the 20th century, that being the 1970s. Richard Nixon had come into the presidency in 1968. He had been Dwight D. Eisenhower's vice president throughout the 1950s. He'd actually run uh, for governor of California earlier in the 60s and had lost. But in 1968, he, cho he chose to run as president of the United States and won, speaking for what he called the silent majority. Nixon had promised a number of things. First of all, ending the Vietnam War. And that's when we pick up our lecture today. One of the things that Nixon realized was that one of the reasons why Vietnam was continuing was because North Vietnam was being supported by two of its and two of the most powerful communist allies in the world at the time. That, of course, being China and, of course, the Soviet Union. Throughout the early 1970s, Nixon did something completely unprecedented. We have to remember that back in the 1950s, when he was vice president under Eisenhower, Nixon was one of the big communist hunters. Uh, he was on the House Un-American Activities Committee. He was one of those that prosecuted and went after communists. And yet here he was in the early 1970s, beginning this new decade, as someone who was now reaching out for the first time to the two major communist superpowers. That of course being the People's Republic of China, the communist government of China, and of course the Soviet Union, now under the leadership of the premier Leonid Brezhnev. And one of the reasons why he does this is he basically convinces both of these powers that neither one of them really had any vested interest and there really wasn't any profitability. There wasn't anything to their advantage to continue to support the North Vietnamese. And so he reaches out and essentially establishes peaceful relationships with both of these major communist powers. And kind of one of the results is, first of all, they both break off any kind of support to the North Vietnamese. Within a year or so, the Vietnam War is over. Victory for Richard Nixon. Another thing that also happens is that the Cold War cools. We have this period of what's called detente or relaxation of the this very tense relationship that it actually cost both countries, the Soviet Union and the United States, lives, money, and resources uh, ever since the end of World War II. And then, of course, the crowning achievement of that detente, that relaxed relationship, was the first SALT Treaty, which was the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, where both countries, the United States and the Soviet Union, began the process of dismantling and limiting the manufacture of nuclear missiles. At the same time this was happening, there were some major cultural events that were happening in the United States that were changing um, how Americans saw a number of major issues in the United States. In 1973, the Supreme Court ruled on a case in front of them referred to as Roe v. Wade. These two names were actually pseudonyms, neither one were the actual names of the plaintiffs. But the case in question was whether or not the constitutional right to privacy, which is actually a collection of an interpretation of a collection of the rights listed in the, the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, 
did this right to privacy extend to a woman's ability to terminate a pregnancy? In other words, to have an abortion. On one side, you had those that were called the right to life movement, who were very much against legalizing any form of abortion. And then, of course, you had the pro-choice, uh, as they refer to themselves, as the side that wanted a woman to at least have the legal opportunity to be able to terminate a pregnancy. This Supreme Court case, Roe v. Wade, ultimately decided that a woman, in fact, did have a constitutional right to privacy and thus the right to terminate a pregnancy within the first trimester, in other words, within the first three months of her pregnancy. Anything beyond that was left up to the states. Now, unfortunately, rather than solve this issue once and for all in the United States, this Supreme Court case ultimately led to the debate growing even more. The Supreme Court case, while not a, an order uh, actually legalizing uh, abortion, simply said that a woman's right to do it was not unconstitutional and therefore was constitutional and therefore she had the right to do it. This, of course, led the debate wide open as far as laws that could limit abortion rights, laws that would extend abor abortion rights, and ultimately has been the beginning point to the debate where we see it today. Another major movement that happened during the Nixon administration, and is actually, of course, of special uh, importance to us in the core academy is the environmental movement. Uh, in 1970, the Environmental Protection Agency was created. By the way, this was created during the Nixon administration. It was created by President Richard Nixon himself. The Clean Air Act was also passed. These two major government pieces of legislation were really the first time that the federal government took a major stand when it came to, for the first time, protecting the environment of the territory of the United States. And this is largely to the credit of President Nixon. This is the first time this had happened. Uh, unfortunately, these acts often get forgotten in light of what we will see here in just a little bit. But looking at these, the Environmental Protection Agency was established and its job was set to enforce pollution standards. So now for the first time, companies that had typically been contributors to a growing pollution problem in this country now had certain standards that they had to follow so that um, they would not be able to pollute as much. There, there was limits per, put on what they could dump in oceans or what could be emanated up into the sky, so on and so forth. Unfortunately, as we will learn later on in our next PowerPoint, looking at the remainder of the 1970s, in many cases, the damage had really already been done. But this was the first step to, to attempting to clean it up. The Clean Air Act also was a major step. For the first time, cars were only allowed to emit so many pollutants. And this is actually one of the reasons why cars in the 1970s got so big, because a lot of car companies realized that these gadgets that they had to attach onto the engines of American cars in order to control pollution also limited the amount of power that could be put out by cars. And so what did the American car companies do in response? Of course, they made the cars bigger. And this, of course, led to the huge boats of, you know, Cadillacs and Lincolns and the big cars, uh, you know, the big pit mobiles, as we used to call them uh, in the 1970s. Unfortunately for Richard Nixon, despite these various successes, there was something looming 
as he was preparing to run for re-election in 1972 that ultimately would derail his presidency and would lead to one of the, if not the, greatest scandal ever to rock a presidential administration in American history. In June of 1972, five men were arrested after being found to have broken in to offices at the Watergate Hotel. Now, these offices probably wouldn't be all that big of a deal if they hadn't been the offices of the Democratic National Committee. Now, to everybody listening to this, they're scratching their head going, Mr. Amos, why do we care? The Democratic National Committee was the organization that was in charge of all of the Democrats, uh, the Democratic Party's elections throughout the entire country. Everything down from local and municipal elections like governors and mayors and local representatives and congressmen all the way up to the Democrats nominee for President of the United States. Now, what made this even more suspicious was, first of all, the burglars weren't trying to steal anything quite the difference, quite different. They were there to deliver or plant something. And what they were discovered planting or having in their possession was a number of bugging equipment, cameras, microphones, things to essentially bug the offices. So who would want to listen in or hear or know what was going on behind the scenes of the Democratic National Committee. The other thing that made it very suspicious was how these five individuals were, were paid. It was discovered that they had been paid. Now, where did the money come from? This gave a lot of hints that there may be larger organizations involved in what seemed to be kind of a small time break-in. Lastly, one of the five individuals, a man by the name of James McCord, was a former security advisor of Nixon's campaign staff known as the Committee to Re-elect the President, or CREEP. Yes, it actually was called CREEP. This was a group of people, an organization that the President of the United States, President Nixon, had actually put together specifically to help him get re-elected in 1972. And one of these burglars, as it was discovered in newspapers, was actually a member of that organization. This led a number of people in the media to suspect that a connection possibly between the president himself and these burglars may in fact exist. Unfortunately, almost right from the beginning of when these five burglars were arrested, the president himself, as it was learned later on, began to immediately attempt to slow the investigation as to who these individuals were, who they were being paid by, what their connection was to other people in the Nixon administration. This became known as the Watergate cover-up. And what eventually began to happen was that Nixon began using the powers of the president to slow the investigation into these five burglars. And he used actually the power of the president. He used members of the CIA and FBI to actually halt and slow down. That's actually a federal offense. Slow down the investigation of federal investigators, people in the federal government trying to figure out what this all was. Now, in addition to what the federal government was doing, the media, led by two reporters by the name of Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, these were two actually very young, relatively unexperienced or inexperienced uh, reporters at the Washington Post, they began investigating the connection between the President of the United States and this burglary at the Watergate Hotel. And lo and behold, as 1972 and then 1973 dragged on, they published more and more stories in the Washington Post indicating and providing information that there was in fact a connection and that there were efforts being made 
by the President of the United States, or at least people working directly under him, to obscure the investigation, in other words, slow it down, prevent people from discovering any possible connections between the burglars and people who worked at the White House. Now, Nixon had a small group of people that were his close advisors, and these men were the ones who attempted to try and shield the president from any possible connection. They were the ones who were also reporting directly to the president. His instruction to them, now this is a, a very generalized view of this uh, event in history, his instruction to these men were to slow down the investigation, cover it up, make sure that it did not come to light, make sure that the media would not figure out about it. Now, this slide here, the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the wanted poster you see over on the right is a list of various names of people. Now, we don't have time to go into it right, right away, and you guys will see a little bit more information about this in your reading, in the Big Fat Notebook assignment, and of course, in our videos about what this really was all about. By the beginning of 1973, James McCord, who had been one of the five burglars, admitted that members of Nixon's administration ordered the Watergate break-in. In other words, they were under direct orders by people who worked for the President of the United States to break into the Watergate Hotel and plant all of these bugging devices and to illegally uh, get information about who the various nominees for various offices the Democrats had in mind. The Senate appointed a special committee to investigate it. Nixon appointed a, a investigator as well. His name was Archibald Cox. However, as time went on, Cox found more and more and more information connecting the president to the Watergate scandal. And eventually, the president himself actually had Cox fired. Uh, this enraged people in the Congress and was a pretty clear indication that in fact, Nixon must have some direct connection to the Watergate burglary. And as time went on, it was discovered that just about all of those that worked directly with the president in the White House had had some kind of connection in the Watergate burglary or similar burglaries around the entire country. There had been many such uh, illegal activities that had been run by people who were under orders by um, from people who worked directly with Nixon to essentially gather all kinds of scandalous information on people that Nixon might in fact run against. Now the interesting thing is in 1972, Nixon easily wins against his opponent. He actually wins in one of the biggest landslides in American history up until that point. In fact, the only election that uh, someone had won by a bigger margin had been FDR back during uh, the Depression and World War II eras. Now, where this investigation really came to a head was when it was discovered that Nixon, President Nixon, had actually tape recorded um, conversations inside the Oval Office, that's the President's own office inside the White House. And those conversations were between him and a lot of the people who it had been discovered were involved with the Watergate uh, scandal, the whole Watergate burglary, this whole Watergate incident. And when it was discovered that these tapes existed, it was immediately ordered that Nixon give up these tapes. Archibald Cox, who was the, the guy who Nixon himself had been actually forced to appoint as someone who was investigating 
this whole situation, demanded that Nixon hand over these tapes. Nixon refused. There is a part of the Constitution that refers to the president as having a power called executive privilege. In other words, the president, after all, is in fact a private individual just like everybody else. He just happens to be in this very, very public office, uh, the presidency of the United States. And he has the right to his, his privacy and his uh, private possession, so on and so forth. Nixon claimed that these tapes were his private, um, were, were part of his private affairs and therefore couldn't be touched by any kind of court. This situation was taken all the way up to the Supreme Court in the Supreme Court decision Nixon versus the United States. The Supreme Court ruled that executive privilege did not apply because these tapes were potential evidence in a criminal case, and therefore he was forced to give them up. At the same time this was happening, if that wasn't enough, Nixon's own vice president, Spiro Agnew, resigned facing charges of bribery and tax evasion. Now, what's interesting is a lot of people have thought that had something to do with the Watergate scandal. In fact, it didn't. It didn't have anything to do with the Watergate scandal. But it just made the whole Nixon administration just stink in the eyes of the American people. Here, their president was under investigation, under criminal charges. The vice president resigns in disgrace. It was just one nightmare after another. Now, after Nixon turned over the tapes, it was immediately discovered that Nixon had ordered a cover-up and a intentional blocking of the investigation uh, into the Watergate scandal. And it had, it had revealed the truth that Nixon had in fact been involved. He hadn't necessarily ordered the burglary itself, but once he found out about it, rather than admitting to it and exposing the truth to the media and the American public, he decided to try and hide it. And he actually abused his presidential powers in trying to hide it. And that was Nixon's great mistake. When all this information came to light, the both the House Judiciary Committee and the Senate began drawing up articles of impeachment. Now, impeachment is a very interesting process. A lot of people believe that when a president, or for that matter, Supreme Court Justice, that's someone else who can be impeached, if they are in fact impeached, what it means is that they are removed from office. In fact, that is incorrect. Impeachment is actually a two-step process. It involves the two houses of the Congress of the United States. The House of the United States draws up what are called articles of impeachment. These are essentially charges against the president. We have seen this happen now twice against President Donald Trump. The second part, however, involves the Senate, the other house of the Congress of the United States, and they act as a court of impeachment to determine whether or not the president is in fact guilty of the charges leveled against him by the House of the Repres by the, ha the, the House of Representatives. By this time, it was already discovered that the Senate was going to find Nixon guilty of those charges. So rather than go through that whole process, on August 8th, 1974, Nixon goes down in American history as the only president ever to resign from the office of the presidency. His successor, Gerald Ford, who had been appointed in Spiro Agnew's absence, was promptly um, sworn in as President of the United States. And in fact, one of the first actions that Ford executes as President of the United States is to actually pardon Nixon. Not because he felt any particular loyalty, loyalty to him, but because he wanted, as he called it, the great national nightmare to be over. 
So you guys have seen here, there's actually quite a few changes as far as what happens in the United States during these early years of the 1970s that we refer to as the Nixon years. What I'd like you guys to really look at are specifically, and when I read your guys' paragraphs, I want to hear and read what were specific political, economic, or social changes. Some of you guys like to put just kind of a, a, a mishmash of just things that happened. This is a summary. This is a look at how America had changed during these early years of this decade. So that's what we would like to look at in this paragraph that's going to finish up our look here at these early years of the 1970s. Our first look at the last decades of the 20th century.